Hello and welcome back to A History of Maryland. This is part two of episode one, Lie Back and Think of Crab Cakes. Today we'll continue to paint the political backdrop of the founding of Maryland by focusing on the political career of its chief architect. Few American colonial histories are as inextricably linked to the lives of a single family as much as Maryland is linked with the lives of the Calverts. The career of George Calvert is integral to Maryland's story. Because it not only gives you a grand political setting where all of this is able to come about, it also describes how he personally has the means to achieve his goals. And it's an interesting story. Calvert was in the middle of just about everything going on during the reign of James I, but he's virtually invisible in any history that isn't specifically about him. And the more I learn about Maryland history, the more I see this sort of thing as a common theme, continually ignored by broader histories, and often seeming to fly under the radar for one reason or another. And I want to tell those stories. So let me introduce you properly to George Calvert, who over the next two podcasts will become Sir George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore. No, that's late 60s, early 70s psych rock trio, Sir Lord Baltimore. If you came for them, I'm sorry, that's a different podcast. When it comes to 70s hard rock, I'm more of a Thin Lizzy guy than a stoner rock guy, so I can't really claim to know a lot about them. But I did briefly peruse their lyrics, perchance they might contain some long-forgotten lore about our Lord Baltimore. I I couldn't decipher any. Probably because they're from New York, and the name of the band is actually a reference to a character in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, so it has nothing to do with the actual Barons of Baltimore. Or maybe I need to try listening to it backwards. Far out. In the meantime, let's just follow the trails of this psychedelic freakout and flash back to our story already in progress. I hear calling me. George Calvert was born late in the winter of 1579-1580 to his father Leonard Calvert and his mother Alice Crossland. They were gentry of modest means who made their home in Richmondshire, which is in northern Yorkshire. It was an area which had a reputation for being predominantly Catholic and the Calvert family was no exception. After George's mother died, either in his infancy or early childhood, there are conflicting stories, his father married Alice's cousin, Grace Crossland. Grace seems to have been an open and unrepentant Catholic, and the family developed something of a rap sheet with the authorities for being recusants and for having their children taught from papist primers. Well, the hand of law came down eventually and pressured Leonard to conform to the Anglican Church, which he did, at least once, maybe twice after a bit of religious backsliding, and they forced him to hire Protestant teachers for the Calvert children. So despite this early Catholic influence, George would join the Anglican Church and would remain outwardly at least a Protestant throughout the duration of his political career. Maryland is famously a Catholic colony, imagineered into reality by a Catholic Lord Baltimore. But just how Catholic was George Calvert during his schooling and his political career? A period where he'd constantly have to appear to conform and give oaths of supremacy in order to move on any further. The reasons behind his open conversion to Catholicism after leaving office is one of the great debates of his story. Was he a faithful Anglican who only after some great epiphany embraced the Roman Church? Was he a secret Catholic all along with a hidden altar in his house, practicing clandestine masses with disguised priests? who faced a potential death penalty for performing the rites? Or is it something in between? Well, that depends on what sources you read. We'll be discussing my sources at the end of today's podcast, and I'll wade a little deeper into the crypto-Catholic debate in Part 3, when Calvert converts publicly. Just know that this is a question that'll keep popping up, and that for now, he is by all appearances a faithful Anglican. He is a Protestant. In his teens... George was sent off to Trinity College at Oxford to learn foreign languages. Latin, French, Spanish, and Italian seems to have been his specialties, 
He graduated in 1597 and then spent a further three years studying municipal law at Lincoln's Inn. So he developed a skill set for attaining work as some sort of bureaucrat, civil servant, or diplomatic envoy. But as it is today, it's not always what you know, it's who you know. That was even truer then than it is now, especially in the realm of royal courts and public offices. Family connections were key and your career depended on the favor of more powerful people. And in return, they expected your loyalty. What we might criticize today as naked nepotism was simply the way things were done back then. It was expected that you would feather the nests of as many family and friends as you could. It was reputedly a cousin of Calvert's who had the connections to open up the door wide enough for George to get a foot in. The story goes that Calvert had been bumming around Europe for a few years after graduating, and after his cousin pulled a few strings, George was asked if he could swing by the English embassy in France, grab a few letters, and deliver them back across the channel to a secretary of Robert Cecil's, which Calvert promptly did, and he was taken on board in some menial capacity to Cecil's office. Some versions have Cecil himself bumping into Calvert while in Europe and liking him and offering him a job then and there, but Calvert was a nobody and that story rings a little too easy and fortuitous to me. Regardless, once he was in on the ground floor, he'd display an aptitude and diligence which would always keep him useful, as well as a modesty and an unquestioned loyalty to the hands that fed him that would always keep him trusted. He was the perfect guy to dump your whole workload of sensitive materials onto and not worry that he'd do anything but exactly what he was told to do with them. While the big kahunas like Robert Cecil imagineered and negotiated big policy decisions, Calvert was the guy scribbling it all down in the background, rushing around trying to get things sealed, stamped, and delivered. Basically, he was a dependable cog of the bureaucracy. By late 1604, Calvert was already cashing in on his ability to grant access to Cecil, building connections and accruing favors, and probably accepting money, presents, and favors in return. Yet again, this is the way things were done. So now that he'd landed a job working for the most powerful man in Britain outside of the king, the next logical step for a young gentleman of the age would be to go a courting, settle down with a little lady, and work on having a few critters to keep the family dynasty going. In November 1604, he married Anne Min. I wish I could tell you more about her, but info is pretty sparse, vague, and often contradictory. She appears to come from a relatively wealthy and connected family. Some accounts have her family connections as the one landing Calvert the job with Cecil. But I'm not sure the dates match up unless they had a long courtship period. Some sources claim she was staunchly Catholic. But among other arguments against that, she was both married and buried in Anglican ceremonies. I'll get more into that debate a little later when I talk about Calvert's conversion to Catholicism. What we do know is that they sure did make some critters. Ten in all. We know that it was likely complications with the 11th pregnancy which killed Anne in 1622. And we know George Calvert would be devastated by this. Pretty much any existing documentation on George and Anne's relationship suggests he was a dutiful family man and that he loved and depended on her immensely, by his own admission. Back in the happier days of late 1605, their first child was born. They named him Cecil, in honor of their powerful patron, Robert Cecil, who'd become godfather to the child. And here's yet another example of how the story can change depending on how much of a crypto-Catholic you believe George to be at this time. Because this could have all just been a cover. Cecil may have really been named after St. Cecilia. George and Anne had been married on St. Cecilia's Day, November 22nd, and Cecilia may have been an important saint to them. In short, the name was a symbolic code of their true beliefs. Except, I'm not really sure how the patron saint of music plays into the story of the Calverts. And technically, Anglicans venerated saints too. They just didn't pray to them. So personally, I'm going with the whole St. Cecilia's Day thing being a happy coincidence and the name of the child being based on the guy who actually, you know, puts food on their table, Robert Cecil. Regardless, Cecil Calvert will survive childhood to become George's heir. And he'll play a big part later on in our narrative, as will their second son, Leonard, who was born in 1606. George and Anne would then have two daughters in quick succession, Anne and Dorothy, and then Elizabeth, and George, and Grace, and Helen, and then Francis, and then Henry, and then John. And that's just the brood from his first marriage. 
There's barely any info on most of them. Child mortality being what it was in the 17th century, certainly one or more of these children died young. The only scrap I can find about George Jr. is that he's said to have died in Virginia in 1667, possibly killed in a hurricane. A few others might have gone down in a shipwreck in 1631. We'll speculate on that hypothesis in a later episode. But for our narrative, we only really have to remember Cecil and Leonard. And to remember the fact that George Calvert Sr. had a lot of mouths to feed. So all the better for him that the work and promotions would come thick and fast over the next few years. He was relied on more and more by Robert Cecil. And between the years 1607 and 1611, he'd get his first experiences in the range of political vocations to which he'd be applied. He'd land his first bureaucratic gig with the clerkship of the crown for Connaught, Ireland in 1607, an administrative paper-pushing job at a far-off branch of the royal court system. This would be a beginning of a long relationship with Ireland for him. He'd also make his first forays into Parliament. Cecil used them to fill an empty seat from a borough in Cornwall, where he'd act as a dutiful plant for royal interests. Essentially, his job was to stand up and say, Well, you know what I think we should do? I think we should give the king whatever he wants. After which, he'd look around nervously at all the scowling faces. Cecil would also continue making use of Calvert's linguistic skills as a translator and diplomatic envoy and courier. Soon enough, this proximity to the powerful Secretary of State would bring Calvert into proximity with the king himself. He would be appointed first to the clerk of the Signet in 1609, where he would draft official papers for the king to sign, and then in 1610 to clerk of the Privy Council, who were the senior advisors to the king. So at this point, George Calvert is right at the nerve center of power in Jacobian England. But he's there as a clerk, not as a big wheel of the decision-making process. And he's there because he's a dependable worker bee, not because he has, you know, Machiavellian ambitions towards higher office. And this is what King James liked about George Calvert. James was a man of letters himself, and he began involving Calvert in some of his own pet projects to that end. In 1611, His Highness got himself involved in a theological flame war going on in the United Provinces, what we call the Netherlands today, between rival groups of Calvinists. It was part of a big, convoluted ball of religious disputes, which then became tangled with political factions, fighting over whether or not to have centralized or federalist government. All very important for Dutch history, but which really had sweet Fanny Adams to do with James I over in England. But James being James, he had to put in his two pence, and he drafted a bunch of letters attacking the prominent theologian of the Arminian side of the conflict, and he employed George Calvert in the research and transcription of these attacks. James loved to write and to dictate words almost as much as he liked dictating what people should think. And for him, the one was mostly a tool to achieve the other. It was around this same time that the King James Bible was finally being finished up and printed. Now, he didn't write or translate that version of the Bible himself. He had dozens of people working on it. But he did make it clear he wanted the translations to bias towards Anglicanism as opposed to Puritanism. Sure, he had some Puritans working on it to appear to be even-handed. But the Geneva Bible that the King James Version was specifically created to replace was full of puritanical annotations that James himself found loathsome and seditious against his church. He wrote and published a few books himself. Most interestingly, back in 1597, he wrote one on witchcraft called Demonology. He was obsessed with the subject and traveled and sat in on witch trials while researching. It would influence a lot of later works on the subject, including certain bits lifted by William Shakespeare for his play Macbeth. Really, the Great Bard was a total suck-up to King James. A bunch of his later plays kept it safe with barely concealed pro-Jacobean subtexts, while other playwrights were being jailed and their plays shut down for actually being, you know, edgy and subversive. I'm sorry, that has nothing to do with Maryland. It was just a cheap attempt to drag in a name somebody might have actually heard of. So where were we? Ah, yes. Kissing King James's backside. George Calvert was about to have to do even more of that. Because in 1612, his great patron and the namesake and godfather to his child, Robert Cecil, died. This changed the whole dynamic at court. The vacuum left by Cecil was filled with new court favorites who didn't necessarily care much for Calvert. 
His future was uncertain for a time, and he kept his head down and kept grinding along with whatever tasks the king had for him. These duties included handling correspondence with the Spanish embassy and other miscellaneous diplomatic missions. But soon enough, this would put him in the center of international policy, take him to the zenith of his political career, and then leave him suddenly out in the cold. And the main engine of this rise and fall was the diplomatic matter of the Spanish match, wherein James I tried to seal a grand alliance with England's old nemesis, Spain, via marriage between his son Charles and the Infanta, or the Princess of Spain. And that is where we will pause the narrative for today, with Calvert's career hanging in the balance after the death of his powerful patron. We'll pick back up in the third and final installment of Lie Back and Think of Crab Cakes, where we'll learn more about the Spanish match and finally follow Calvert to the height of his political career, his conversion to the Roman Church, and his achieving the title of the first Baron of Baltimore, which all corresponds roughly with the rest of the reign of James I up to about the year 1625. But for the last few minutes, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about the sources I've been using for this period and to bombard you with all of the necessary caveats inherent in letting me write a podcast. I mean, what are you, nuts? I'm not a historian. I sell people fish. And I want to make it perfectly clear that this is a history of Maryland, not the history of Maryland. All I'm doing is reading a bunch of sources, interpreting it as best as I can, and spewing it all back up in the most entertaining manner I can. There's probably all sorts of different takes you might have on the same material viewed through your own prism. So that's why I think it's important to let you know where all this is coming from. I'll tell you no lie, this is low-budget history. I work six days a week, commute three hours a day, so I'm lean on both time and money. The vast majority of my sources are ones I can download for free, and I don't really have the time to be studying in a university library or anything. So some of my material is extremely dated, and there very well may be some newer, more in-depth resources out there that I'm completely unaware of. I could be missing part of the picture. So I'll do my best to mention specific sources whenever I get into territory that might be a little iffy. So with that out of the way, here's a quick overview of my principal source material as of right now. When it comes to in-depth history, you usually want as many primary sources as possible. Primary sources are materials that were written at the time, the stuff all of these other history books are basing their history on. And for the Calvert period, I have Narratives of Early Maryland, which is a collection of some of this sort of stuff. We have Father White's description of the voyage of the Ark and Dove, all sorts of letters and extracts from leading figures of the time, first-hand accounts of important events, straight from the horse's mouth. Or at least straight from the first or second guy to hear it from the horse's mouth. In other words, we're talking about the good stuff, man. Unfortunately, 17th century English can be a little arcane and archaic, even without the laissez-faire attitude towards spelling that was endemic before standardization. Now, I'm sure some people totally dig delving into the verbal miasma and deciphering this stuff in the raw, but for me, it's like trying to play chess with a migraine. I just want to go lay down. But I have early narratives as a source, And when it becomes directly applicable, like say when I do an episode on Father White's voyage, I will be utilizing it. Or at least I'll give it the old college dropout try. I also downloaded a bunch of 19th century histories, most of which were little more used than a Wikipedia article, for this period at least, and usually a little too simplistically patriotic in their biases. Kind of rah-rah Maryland when I'm looking for a little moral nuance to the Calverts. But there are a couple exceptions which have been very handy. The first is Terra Mariae, or Threads of Maryland Colonial History, written by Edward D. Neal in 1867. Neal was an assistant secretary to Abraham Lincoln and then Andrew Johnson, and he had a sideline in writing colonial histories of some of the states. I dig this book. It's sprinkled with all sorts of little details and facts that I can't seem to find anywhere else. Sometimes that's because those facts are wrong. But even then, it's usually an interesting example of how history changes thanks to the work of later scholars. The problem with the book is that most of the information just sort of floats in the ether. He almost assumes you know everything about history already, and he's just sharing little things with you he's managed to dig up in archives that are stitched together in some bare-bones sort of chronological way. 
To get a more focused narrative, I've been using a series of lectures by Clayton Coleman Hall, given in 1904, and compiled into a book called The Lord's Baltimore and the Maryland Palatinate. Incidentally, Hall also edited the early Maryland narratives, and he wrote an encyclopedia of sorts called Baltimore, Its History and People, that I'm trying to get my hands on in a free and easy format as we speak. The Lord's Baltimore is a good companion to Terra Mariae, and manages the general arc of the story in some detail often with slightly different perspectives on the same history, which is what I'm looking for. But even using both together leaves gaps where I've had to jump to conclusions or give an educated guess. A lot of times, there's a definitive sequence of events, but not a whole lot of clarity on why event A led to event B. I've surfed the web at every opportunity as well, uh, Maryland.gov, historical archives, even blogs made by former archivists like Peter Papenfuse, Ancestry sites have a lot of surprisingly good leads. There are online archives of Parliament and its members going back for centuries. I also do plenty of -of run-of-the-mill wiki diving for thumbnail chronologies and for quick bios of the side characters and for source leads. One source which continually popped up on these sites was a book called English and Catholic, The Lord's Baltimore in the 17th Century by John D. Krugler. About halfway through writing part one of episode one, I finally broke down and ponied up for the book. And it was totally worth it. It's super in-depth, with much more up-to-date research. The book was published in 2010, and it manages to fill in a lot of the gaps that the other sources had left. The scope of the book is narrower than some. It's a political history of the Calverts and a social history of Catholics in Protestant England. But within its range, it's the definitive book on the early Calverts, as far as I can tell. I highly recommend it if you're into this period, and I lean on it heavily for these early episodes. So those are my early sources. They will no doubt change and expand as we pass through time, and I will let you know of any major new sources that come down the pike. Also, if you're interested, everything I've mentioned so far is free to download on things like Google Books, with the exception of English and Catholic. But that one's totally worth the 12 bucks or whatever it was if you want an in-depth book on this period. And that, my friends, is the end of part two. Please join us for part three of episode one as we wrap up the last exciting twists of George Calvert's political career. Then we'll finally be on to episode two, where we'll actually begin talking about the new world and start getting on boats and stuff. It's going to start getting real. Until then, this has been A History of Maryland, and thank you for your patience with me getting this out. I did end up getting a few teeth yanked, And I tried a few times to get this recorded right after surgery with mixed results. It's part of the reason the voice editing is even choppier than usual on this podcast. But it makes for a fun game of which audio takes were done under the influence of pain medication. See if you can find them all. Part 3 is mostly finished and should be coming along soon. Thanks again, and I will see you then. You know, figuratively speaking, this is a podcast we can't really see each other. Bring back. Bring back.